Good morning, everybody, and greetings. My name is Jason DePinto. I am uh, an active duty Navy chaplain, and I've been part of the Vineyard Movement since uh, 1998, so just coming on 20 years this year. I've been a part of Coast since 2012, and uh, it's a joy to worship with you today. Uh, the interim pastor uh, is Jason Toms. Not to be confused with me, we look a lot alike. Uh, we're both, <laughs> both wearing denim button-up shirts today. This was a gift. I never thought I'd buy another denim shirt after 1998. But I was told that it's come back around, and it's okay, uh, again. Uh, I may or may not have ditched the old long sleeve western style one that had been sitting around my closet for many, many years when I got this one. It's like you always need one, you know, of some things. So I sort of thought, well, I just always need a denim shirt, but I was so out of fashion for so long, and now apparently they're back. So, um, you know, I, I was asked to speak today by Jason Tom, and uh, honestly, if I was being completely real with you, uh, I was a little bit hesitant. Uh, this is a, it's been kind of a rough month for me, and uh, I'm sure it's been a rough month for a lot of people, but I wasn't really sure if this was the right week, but I, I agreed to do it. Um, I've been going through a lot, in addition to some of the stuff that we've been going through at the church. Uh, obviously, for those of you who are members here, you know that uh, our, one of our senior pastors resigned about a month ago in the wake of some difficult revelations that he shared. But our church isn't really alone uh, if you follow these sorts of things. Willow Creek Community Church, which is one of the biggest churches in, in the United States, uh, their pastor, oh, hey, now I'm really on. Uh, Willow Creek Community Church, their senior pastor, Bill Hybels, uh, also stepped down after some allegations of interactions with his staff. Am I really loud? Okay, I'm just going to talk really quietly. So that's obviously pretty difficult as well. And then a uh, short time after things happened here, one of the other pastors in our area um, from Grace Vineyard up in Oceanside, he had a, a stroke. And so he's been dealing with that. Uh, he's a friend of mine and one of my mentors. A couple days after that, one of my longtime friends here in San Diego, somebody I've known since I first moved here, he and I would kind of hang out at the gym together and became friends. He's probably mid-40s. He just had a sudden heart attack and, and passed away. Um, probably about two weeks ago. And then last Friday, um, I was responding to a home here in San Diego, Coast Guard home for a member that I've been working with as a chaplain for a few months and found out that uh, before we were able to arrive, he had died from suicide. And so I spent most of last weekend with his family and uh, working on that. I have a committal service tomorrow for him. So it's been kind of heavy for me. And of course, if that's not enough, I have two graduate finals on Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's all right. Just keep me in your prayers. Uh, I just found out last night that my sending church in Connecticut, the church I've been a part of, sort of was my, the church I grew up in in the vineyard, they're going to be transitioning uh, and kind of closing their doors here in the next little while. So that's, that's also kind of emotional. And then I, I feel myself getting overwhelmed, maybe even a little depressed. Um, sometimes it feels a little bit like I'm swimming. And the, the waves kind of come, and I don't quite know where they're coming from, and, and sometimes they catch me off guard, and I take a mouthful of water, emotionally speaking, and have to kind of fight my way to the surface. But in the middle of all that, I've also had some pretty incredible moments of grace. I've had people reach out to me that I don't even normally talk to all that often, and just say, hey, I was thinking about you. What's new? How are you doing? And... Uh, I had somebody from my home group reach out to me this week, too, that uh, a friend of mine, a new friend, and just say, hey, I was thinking about you. Uh, how can I support you? And uh, that really meant a lot to me. And I uh, came home from a work trip on Friday <clears throat> and opened up my mailbox, and there was homemade banana bread sitting waiting for me in the mailbox. And if that doesn't say that God loves you, I don't know what does. <laughs> And then just, just for the extravagant nature of, of generosity, my next door neighbor, who I've talked to many of you about, she's 91 years old. She's from Argentina. She grew up hearing Ava Perón give speeches in the squares of Buenos Aires. She came over to my house at probably 8 o'clock in the morning yesterday with a chocolate cake uh, that she had just made for me because it's going to be my birthday here in a week. And she just was like, I just want to make this for you. So, you know... I feel overwhelmed by the bad things that are happening, but also by just little acts of generosity that have been happening. And, and I've been reminded over and over again that I, I don't really have to be everywhere doing everything for everyone all the time. And I think for our church, I, 
I think that's true too. We don't have to be everywhere doing everything for everyone all the time. But as we listen to the voice of God in our lives, and I've been listening to the voice of God in my life, my desire is to be where it matters, when it matters, with what matters. That's one of the things that we say a lot in the chaplain corps is we can't be everywhere, but we need to listen to the voice of God to be where it matters, when it matters, with what matters. And that's what I'm striving to do. And I think in that paradox of feeling overwhelmed and also cared for, maybe there's something of a message for us from the church. They say that some of the most effective sermons are the ones that you preach to yourself. And so this one is for you all and also a little bit for me today. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 3. That's the passage that we're going to look at, our central passage today. Psalms is uh, the central book in the middle of the Bible. So if you have a physical Bible, you open up right to the middle. You almost certainly hit Psalms. It's 150 chapters long. Uh, for those of us from the Western church, the Eastern churches, they, they number things a little bit differently. So it's a little bit different than that. Um, the Psalms are songs. And so what we get are essentially lyrics to songs that were written for all sorts of things, for celebration, for mourning and lament, crying out to God. They're written in verse, so they're kind of written like poetry, and uh, they are, they're a great legacy for us of the way that the church has worshipped uh, throughout Scripture. So I'm going to read Psalm 3 to you today. The words uh, are going to be on the screen. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. If you have your own version, please feel free to read along. Um, so from Psalm chapter 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Salah. By the way, Salah is a, it, it doesn't have an agreed upon definition. Most scholars think it's like a musical term that means something like a pause or maybe like having a, a praise. Um, and so I guess for, for us today, I want to invite it to mean both. So when you see the word Salah, think pause and praise. Verse three, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill, Salah. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Salah. As we reflect on that, would you just say a quick prayer with me? God, open up your word to us today. Show us what you have for us as a community. Give us your word for us, your people. And help us to be a church that's striving to be where it matters, when it matters, with what matters. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 3 is an interesting psalm because it's uh, one of only 13 psalms that has that little thing at the top. Uh, it's called a superscript. It's, it's actually in the text itself, uh, but it's not, not a verse. It's, uh, it's got its sort of a separate thing, so it's called a superscript. And it basically gives us some context for when and why this was written. And uh, the events themselves that are described here, Absalom, uh, the son of David, and what's going on here, if you have any interest in reading through them in some more detail, you can find them later. You can uh, read 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapters 15 and 16. You can read the entire story for yourself. But when I see that little superscript, it reminded me that uh, as challenging as things have been for me this month, and they really have, they're probably not as traumatic and humiliating as the events that hit King David when he wrote these lyrics. King David was, uh, had reigned for decades as one of the most powerful monarchs in this part of the world. And in fact, his military prowess was legendary. He had actually expanded Israel's dominion far beyond their normal borders. If you can see here, the orange part, that's the, that's the boundaries of Israel uh, at this time under the unified kingdom. And all the green and even the light green is where David had expanded his, uh, the dominion of Israel during this time. And so he had, uh, you know, as the king, he had authority. He had authority over life and death. He had authority of the affairs of the nation. Uh, he had become very wealthy as a result of being king. The nation had become wealthy. He had a, a huge estate with his wives and, and concubines and servants. 
But then David sinned by taking Bathsheba, who was not his wife, and ordering the death of her husband, Uriah the Hittite. And even though David repented when the prophet Nathan confronted him, that sin set in motion an entire series of devastating consequences. And I was just reminded of how sin sometimes has consequences beyond the grace that is available for all of us. And so David's oldest son, Amnon, he uh, assaulted, uh, essentially sexually assaulted his sister Tamar, his half-sister, one of the most disturbing passages in scripture. And then Tamar's uh, brother, Absalom, takes revenge by murdering Amnon. And so Absalom, after the murder, he flees into exile and he's gone for several years and eventually he's permitted to return. But because of the the pain around that, David refuses to see Absalom for several years, for two years after he returns to the kingdom. And, you know, presumably the resentment builds up and builds up, and Absalom begins to mingle with the disgruntled factions in the kingdom. And eventually he starts offering himself as a more sympathetic leader for King David. And finally, Absalom pieces together all the alliances he needs for coup d'etat. David gets wind of this, and he realizes that in order to survive, he has to flee the capital with all of his supporters and all of their families. And so his families and his servants, they grab everything they can. They take off uh, east toward the wilderness. David leaves some family members behind to keep keep the house, and then he basically follows his supporters. And the Bible says that he's weeping and walking barefoot with his head covered in shame. And to add insult to injury, as he's walking along the way, this man named Shammai, who's uh, from the family of King Saul, who is David's predecessor, he comes out and he starts cursing at King David and he's throwing stones at him. And he's accusing him basically of being completely worthless as a king because uh, of the bloodshed on King David's hands because of all of his war fighting. It was David's most humiliating, traumatic experience of his entire life. Everything that he had spent his entire life working on had completely unraveled in that time. People that he thought were his allies and friends had abandoned him and had sided with Absalom. Probably the most painful wound and and betrayal of all was that this was his son. And I'm sure it brought home to David a lot of his own personal failures as a father. One son was murdered. His daughter had been raped. The murderer, uh, the murderer had fled and was now leading a coup d'etat against his own family. Life was literally falling apart for David. Now, thankfully, few of us have ever had to experience anything quite like the trauma that David experienced. But we've all had times when we could identify when things just unravel. When they're going along and then everything just starts to fall apart. Maybe you're like me and you've had kind of a series of emotional challenges that just keep hitting one right after another. And they're not connected, but they build up. Maybe you're so like some of the people I've been working with lately who, who thought their job was secure, but maybe all of a sudden it's not as secure as they thought. Or, or they're facing something at work, maybe some kind of allegations or false allegations. And then all of a sudden you're worried about whether or not you can protect or care for your family. Maybe you're like some of the people I've talked to recently who have a child or a close family member that's dealing with addiction and their life is starting to come off the rails. Maybe they've even accused you of things and then, and then, then they're resistant to attempts to talk and reconcile and all those years of love and sacrifice are starting to fall apart. Maybe you're like one person I met with not that long ago whose marriage seems to be breaking down and they don't know how to stop it. And everything seemed like it was okay, but all of a sudden there's this turn and you're not really sure if life is ever going to be the same again. And it just feels like everything is unraveling. So what do we do when life starts to fall apart like that? I think there are a lot of options. But I look to Psalm 3 and I see that in the midst of his life falling apart, King David wrote a psalm. He basically wrote a song. And that's interesting as a reflection on what it means for us when we experience things like that. Now, uh... I was in a band in college, not my finest moment necessarily, but you know, I can hear many of you saying in your head, oh, of course you were in a band in college, Jason. I, uh, I played drums, I wrote songs. In fact, you can see our little CD up there. Uh, we, uh, we weren't that great. 
all right. But there were some really talented musicians, and we played some gigs around town where I was going to school at the time. And I consider these guys my friends even to this day, even as our lives have gone in very different directions. And it got me thinking, why do so many people start bands at that time in their life, high school, college? Okay, maybe it's delusions of grandeur. That might have been my case. But maybe it's because, especially in those times of life when we're trying to figure out who we are, there's something about music that expresses the core of our hearts better than anything else. That it helps us say the things that we're otherwise having trouble expressing. And I think maybe that's why worship music has been, always been such an important part of the church's worship together. Corporate worship, there's always been music. And of course, in the vineyard, music has been at the core of who we are as a, as a community of churches together that we come together and we sing songs about God. And in fact, maybe that's why David is considered a man after God's own heart. You know, we don't know exactly when David wrote the psalm. It doesn't say, but it seems to be happening right as the events are unfolding. If you read the psalm, it's like in the middle of the events. And it might even be when David is literally preparing to go to war against his own son. Verse 5, up there, you can see that it sort of hints that he, he wrote it after waking up safely after a night's sleep. It says, I lay down and slept, and I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. But it's verse 3 that speaks to my heart. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. When life falls apart, no matter how badly it falls apart, we experience God's strength. We experience God's peace by laying hold of that truth. You, O Lord, are a shield about me. You're the lifter of my head. So let's look a little bit at the passage. I'm just going to kind of go through it. When David cries out to God in verse 1, uh, it says, O Lord, how many are my foes? That word Lord there, it's not the Hebrew word Adonai, uh, if you're familiar with Hebrew, it, that means sort of like just Lord or sovereign Lord. It's actually the word Yahweh. It's the personal covenantal name of God. It's the name of God that's revealed to Moses at the burning bush. And the word uh, Yahweh means something. It's related to the verb to be in, in Hebrew. So it means something like I am what I am, or I will be what I will be, something like that. It's a uh, to address God as Yahweh in song like this, it kind of has the same connotation that you would hear in the New Testament if somebody addressed God as Abba, Father. It's an intimate, sort of personal cry for help. Yahweh, how many are my foes? And then David speaks to God the words of his own enemies in verse 2. Those people who are discrediting his relationship with God, many are saying to my soul, the passage says. David's basically saying, this is hitting me right in my heart, right in my soul, what they're saying to me. There's no deliverance for him in God. That gut punch, because of your sin, David, God is not going to deliver you. It reminds me a little bit of Jesus, right? who is called a son of David, who on the cross stands there and feels, feels that absence, experiences that absence from God as he carries our, uh, the weight of our sin on his shoulders. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And even though God knows all the details of what's going on, I love the fact that David lays it out here in Psalm 3. He tells God what's going on, not because he's trying to give God information, but because he's just laying his burdens on the Lord. He's leaning on the Lord. God, this is what's going on. And David acknowledging, uh, he's acknowledging to God that he's not able to do this on his own strength. To those of us who are familiar with the language of, of recovery from addiction, that kind of idea is pretty familiar. In, uh, in step one of the recovery process, uh, addicts are called to acknowledge that their lives, that they're powerless over their addiction, and that their lives have become unmanageable. David's life had become unmanageable. And for those of us here at Coast, that may hold some resonance as we felt sort of the effects of addictive behavior here in our church over the past few weeks and months. And so for note one, if you like to take notes, if that's your thing, I just wanted to put up here that by ourselves, we are powerless 
when our lives begin to fall apart. By ourselves, we are powerless when our lives begin to fall apart. But verse 3 shifts the focus, you see, from David's circumstances to the Lord. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory, the lifter of my head. That image of the shield goes all the way back to Genesis 15, when God tells Abram, before he's even Abraham, uh, that he is Abram's shield. And that idea of God as our shield is one of the songs that we sang this morning. It occurs all throughout the Psalms specifically and in other places. It means that God is our defender. He is our protector. He shields us from the enemy's attack. And look at how David personalizes it. You're my shield about me. Not just for the nation, not just for the people of Israel. He's, he's taking that on for himself. God, you're the one that's my shield. That's the kind of faith that I want to cultivate in my life. The intimacy that King David finds in this song of worship that's eternally true and uniquely personal. You are the shield about me. And this idea of, of lifting up the head, to lift up a head, it's a Hebrew expression that means to restore someone who is cast down. To lift up the head means to restore to dignity. If you remember the story in Genesis of Joseph, when he's in the house of Potiphar and, and he's in the prison then, and the cupbearer and the bread maker come to him and they're telling him the stories. And Joseph says to the cupbearer that Pharaoh will lift up your head. It's that exact same expression. Going to restore you to your office, restore you to what has been lost. And then verse 4 says, I cried out to the Lord, and he answered from his holy hill. That image of the holy hill, or the holy mountain, that's Jerusalem. Or it's Mount Zion in Jerusalem specifically, where the Ark of the Covenant rested when David left. And the Ark of the Covenant stayed there when David left. If you, if you read 2 Samuel 15, you'll see that the priests and the Levites took the Ark, and they were going to come out with David from the tabernacle to follow David because he was the king. And David actually sent them back into the city and basically said, look, if I find favor with God, I'll be coming back. But if I don't, then let God do to me whatever he sees right. But the presence of the Lord needs to stay on the holy hill. I want to learn to have that kind of humility with God, realizing that my only hope is his grace. So that no matter where I am or what kind of difficult circumstances I find myself in, even if the circumstances are a result of my own sin and failure, I can cry out to the Lord and I know that he's going to hear me and treat me according to his purposes. He hears from his holy hill. And then in verse 5 and 6 up there, it says, well, it reminds us that when we look to God in worship and prayer, when we allow him to be our shield, that's when we experience his peace. It's in verse 5 and 6 that we see that David finds peace. Despite all the anguish, despite all the drama, David was able to find peace in the middle of it. He says, I lay down and slept and I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves around me all along. All of Psalm 3, but especially those two verses... It's kind of like a real-life drama that illustrates what Paul says in Philippians, we see in the New Testament, this idea of don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's, that's that idea that's all through Psalm. No matter what's going on, with prayer and petition, make your request be made known unto God, and he's going to guard you in peace. And that's what David is doing here in Psalm 3. It's similar to the story in Acts chapter 12. If you guys uh, remember um, early in the New Testament church, uh, James, the brother of John, has actually been executed. Peter is, is in prison. He's about to be tried the very next day. And yet Peter has so much peace that the story says that uh, he's resting between two guards. The angel has to hit him to wake him up, to help rescue him. It's that kind of peace, right? David is able to sleep peacefully, even though he's about to go to war with his own son, not because his circumstances are okay, but because God is his shield. 
Or that story in the New Testament where the storm is on the lake and Jesus is on the boat with his disciples and they're afraid they're going to die and they find Jesus asleep in the boat. That's that kind of peace in the midst of the storm. And so David awoke safe and sound because the Lord had sustained him. And his reports came in of thousands marshaled against him. He was not afraid, verse 6. When the Lord is our shield and the one who sustains us, it doesn't matter whether it's tens or thousands or hundreds. The odds don't matter. As Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? In that same chapter, he says, even though we're like a sheep led to the slaughter, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Even if things get so bad that it would ultimately somehow lead to our death, Paul is saying that even then we have peace in God. And of course, David could have said, gotten to the end of verse 6 and just sort of said, Amen. And ended the psalm. But he doesn't. Because it's not just David that's at stake here. David has hundreds of families depending on him. He's the anointed king of Israel. And so like for many of us, anxiety has a way of creeping back in. And he, he cries out again to God, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike my enemies on the cheek and you break the teeth of the wicked. In verse 1, many were rising up against David. Now he uses the same verb to ask God to rise up on his enemies. In verse 2, the critics said that God would not save him. And here David uses the same verb to ask for God's saving power. David pictures his enemies like animals sort of baring their teeth, ready to devour him. And in the psalm, David finds faith that God will break the teeth, which, by the way, is a pretty intense image. <laughs> it's a little, a little heavy, but actually it's interesting because breaking the teeth doesn't kill them. It just renders them powerless. They're not able to affect the plan when their teeth in this image have been broken. And of course, you and I don't have thousands of actual warriors who are trying to kill us. Our circumstances aren't the same as David. We're not facing mutiny or, or insurrection. We're not fleeing our homes. Although, of course, it's important to realize that there are people in this world that are facing things like that. You know, think of places like Syria or Venezuela and more. And I don't want to lose the focus that there are people who actually face those circumstances on a daily basis. But even here at Coast Vineyard, we are facing real challenges. There are potential headwinds that could, could, could cause things to come apart in the months and years ahead if we don't find a way to stand up and face them. Not just the challenges of healing us here on our Sunday gatherings, but the way that the events of the past month or two are affecting other parts of our lives as well. I feel really burdened that there are probably some families that are facing questions of trust in their marriages like they've never faced before. Even with frank conversation and dialogue, fear is creeping in and causing the potential for anxiety and division. I've talked to some people who are, who are sort of revisiting personal spiritual milestones from the past decade. Things like baptisms or weddings or words from the Lord that they've received and questioning those events in the light of things that have come out here in our church in the last a uh, couple of months or month about, about our, our former pastor. And I want to state clearly that the enemy, Satan, will use anything he can to divide us, to frighten us, to tear apart our marriages and our families and our communities, to hold us hostage to mistrust and fear, until ultimately, if he can, consume our lives. But we don't have to live in fear of the enemy. Scripture says that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We do not have to live in fear. But we have to acknowledge the way that the pain, uh, not just the pain of the last month, but, but the pain that we're all experiencing can impact things. And the way that the enemy can try to squeak into different corners of our life. And we have to find a way to stand against the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. And so for us... Note two, again, if you're taking notes, it's just we have to understand who the real enemy is. 
We have to understand who the real enemy is. And I want to take a little bit of a look at Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. I'm going to put the scripture up here. It's a familiar verse if you've heard me preach before. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Just as David was being pursued by Absalom, I feel like this is a season where the enemy is trying to pursue us. And it's not just as a church, but we may feel like we're being pursued as individuals, as families, in other parts of our communities. And we don't have to be afraid, but we have to be alert. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. But it's no coincidence that this passage here in Ephesians chapter 6, this passage about spiritual warfare, it comes at the end of a whole long section about families. Paul talks about husbands and wives, and he talks about parents. He talks about working relationships between bond servants and, and masters in the home. Because if, if that's where tension is going to show up, that's kind of where it takes root. Sometimes it, it starts and it takes root in our families. But our families aren't who we're fighting. We have to pay attention to the schemes or some translations say the wiles of the devil who will use anything he can to take our focus off of God, to try to squeeze through cracks in the wall to get in. Many of you know that I, I was previously married before. It's not something I talk a lot about up here. It's not something I avoid talking about. It's just not something that comes up a lot. But uh, I felt that occur in my own life where I saw Satan kind of sneaking in the cracks in my own marriage and all of a sudden I turned around and had taken root and that really eventually ended up uh, resulting in divorce in 2012. And even then, I didn't even exactly know what was going on. In fact, it wasn't until months later when someone came to me with some additional information <clears throat> about things I never knew during the entire marriage, during the entire separation and divorce, <clears throat> that I was able to catch then a different glimpse of what had happened. And in some ways, I had to grieve all over again with that knowledge. So I've, I've been through that process of having to look back and reframe events in the light of new knowledge. And it's painful. It's hard. But even then, I saw God's faithfulness to me. You guys, his presence, his care, his compassion in the midst of my suffering, I look back and I see God in every step of the way. He knew what was going on in my home even when I didn't. God knew. And in ways that I can only describe as supernatural, God actually allowed me to get a job with the Navy uh, that took me out of the role of daily ministry for almost a three, three and a half year period where I was able to get some help and get counseling and, and, and recover from the things that had happened in the marriage through the divorce. And it allowed me to have space to recover and bloom again before I had to then step back into the role of chaplaincy and deal with some of the challenging things that that presents. So if you're experiencing that sense of reframing the entire past because of what's happening in the church, I guess I want to say that it's okay to let that process happen. But I want to remind you that God is big enough to handle it. That God is strong enough to take care of that and that he has been present all along, all along the way. If God is for us, who can be against us? And so like David, we look to God as our shield and our strength. And that's note three, if you're following along. We look to Jesus Christ, who took our sins upon himself so that we can stand confident and unashamed at judgment day. That's where we put our weight. And we do it through prayer. We do it through worship. We do it through song. We take up the shield through worship and prayer. That is how we take up the shield of God. I just want to look briefly at the second half of that Ephesians passage. Starting in verse 14, 
says, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and in the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of keep peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Say that, take up the shield of faith. Say that, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. How many arrows? All of them. All of them. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. There's so much there, so much we could dive into, but I'm not going to go into it now because I want to finish with Psalm 3. I just want to say a couple of things. We need that. We need the armor of God. We need truth. We need righteousness. We need peace. We desperately need faith and salvation. And we need the word of God. Verse 11 says that you put on the armor of God. And it's this image of constantly putting it on. You know, in a a military zone in 2008 and 2009, I was in Afghanistan in a combat zone. You don't leave the wire. Nobody leaves the wire without their armor. Without your gloves, without your helmet, without your, your goggles, without your flak jacket. Nobody does. And you check each other. You have it? Do you have it? Before anybody leaves the safety of that zone. I know somebody who literally put a sticky note on their door to remind them to not leave the house before they had put on the armor of God through prayer and through worship. And notice how Paul says that we have to pray in the Spirit. We have to be speaking the Holy Spirit's kingdom power in our lives, in our families, in our church. And we have to figure out what does the kingdom look like for our church now? And in that very last verse, Paul says, we have to be making supplication for all the saints. We got to pray for each other. We need each other right now. As a church, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And we were reminded a couple of weeks ago that when Christ was resurrected, his scars were still there. Remember, he pointed them out to his disciples when he reappeared. The hands and feet of Jesus are scarred. But we are the hands and feet of Jesus as the church in the world. And we may feel a little extra scarred right now, but we need each other. If you're hurting, but you're able to be here, even if it's just to pray for others, we need you. If you're actually, if you feel like you're doing pretty good and you're ready to lean forward, then we definitely need you. And if you're one of those people that's hurting and you need us, then we want to be there for you. We want to pray for you. We want to care for you in any way that we can. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what some things are going to look like in the months ahead. We don't know if things are going to need to be paused or adjusted in a different season. But I know for sure that God has spoken to me countless times in this room, through this church, through each and every one of you as I've come up for prayer and in worship. You're my church family. You're my tribe. And I love and care about you as this church. So I'll finish up with David's last exclamation in verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. We read Psalm 3. David reminds us that when we cast ourselves on God alone for deliverance, he gets all the glory and he gets all the praise when he answers our prayer. And his final blessing is, or your final prayer is, your blessing be upon your people. David's not just praying for himself. He's the anointed king of of God's people. And so Absalom's rebellion affects the entire nation. And so David says he asked for God's blessing on all the people. And that's what I want us to do too, to seek God's blessing. As Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you're like me, it may feel a little bit like the world is falling apart lately. But when it does, reflect on the example that we see from King David in Psalm 3. In truly dark times, acknowledge the powerlessness that we face as individuals when we try to tackle this alone. But understand who the real enemy is. It's not the people. It's evil. That will try to tear us apart and then take up the armor of God. Pray in the light of God's kingdom. Remember that God is greater than Satan, that love is greater than hate, that good is greater than evil. For scripture says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. When we take up the armor of God, remembering that he's our shield, God is equipping us to be where it matters, 
when it matters, with what matters for each other, for our city, for our nation, and for the world. If the ministry team and the worship team would come up, please. I'm going to invite both up at this time. We're going to have a a time of worship here in a minute, but I want to at least invite the ministry team to come up because I feel like there have been several real burdens on my heart this week, even in addition to my own challenges. Burdens for marriages in this church. Burdens for those who are in leadership positions, thinking about what it means to move forward. Burdens for holding the tension between people who are having different reactions. And I just want to invite you as the worship team plays, even as they start their song, even before, if any of those things resonate with you, to come up and get prayer for our ministry team. And the church can continue to worship, but get prayer. We also have a couple of people up here, Jason, Tom, and and Abby, who if you're still trying to process through things, if you still have questions or just want to talk about what's been going on, they're up here, uh, Abby's right here, and Jason's on the end, and you can come up and you can uh, talk with them. They'll pray with you too, of course, but, but they're here just to specifically be available as leaders in this church to talk with you. And I also want you to be praying, I put at the bottom of your bulletin, what is the next right step for you? What is the way that you need to take up the shield? Be praying for that as we worship together, and then we'll come back together in just a minute. We're going to stay in in an opportunity to continue to get ministry. So if God is speaking to you, please come down, get prayer for that. Don't do it alone. Remember, we're powerless when we're by ourselves. But for those of you who are still in the chairs, if you would join hands. We join hands together at the end of every service as a sign that we are one community, different ages, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic backgrounds, but we stand in unity together. So let us pray and receive The scripture from the Lord, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Your dismissed church, go in peace to love God and to serve one another. For those of you who are able, please stick around and help folks put things away. And don't forget the, uh, the picnic that we have starting at 12 down at Lindbergh Park.